Turn to 2 Timothy, chapter number 2, as we continue on through the book of 2 Timothy. The question before us this morning is, do you want to serve God? And that might seem like a benign question. It's kind of a churchy kind of question, isn't it? That do you want to serve God or not? But the fact is, is that serving God comes with a cost, but serving God is desperately needed in our day. If we remember in our own church, our mission statement is to advance God's kingdom. I think we at Reformation Church have gone through many changes throughout the years. We've gone through changes in location and and uh, changes in venue, even changes in worship service of, of how we do things, always trying to continue the process of reformation. We've gotten settled here for uh, about two years now. We've been able to be in this building and get stabilized as a church. But now church is the time to advance. It is not time to just say, okay, we got a nice building, we got a nice facility, we got nice AV equipment, uh, we got a nice programs going. We're almost every single night of the week, there's some kind of ha happening here at the church. That's good, that's great. But all of this internal ministry needs to turn now externally to the community that's around us. This world is in dire need of a new reformation. So as we're coming up to Reformation Day, it's not just looking at something from the past. It's what must we do now. We need reformers in our day. We need to serve God now. It's not just heroes of the past. We need heroes of today. Serving God will cost us. Serving God is scary. So how do we do that? Well, beloved, the principles of serving God are actually far more simple than you may think. The living them out may be difficult at times, but we need to serve God. And what we need to do is to reconcile in our heart, do I actually want to serve God? Or do I want to serve myself? Am I really in this thing for me? Am I really trying to live my life trying to get the most pleasure and fulfillment I can find of my own dreams and desires? Or... Do I want my life to really count for something where I sacrifice my will, as we just sang, for his? Let us read our text this morning, 2 Timothy chapter number 2, starting in verse number 20. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, love, faith, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. The first thing we see on the first slide there is that if you want to serve God, you need to get rid of what is dishonorable. Thank you. So we see here some, some dirty old clay pots. Now there is in every home those vessels that are of gold and silver. You know those special things you only bring out during... Uh, uh, Thanksgiving, those, the nice silverware, because we have silverware that we use, and then you got the nice stuff. You know, you got the, the, the good plates and the ones that all match, not the ones that are all mismatched. You know, those are the ones you lay out for your guests. Those things that are there for the special occasions, for honorable use. And then there are other vessels in a household that are for dishonorable use. This doesn't mean necessarily a sinful thing, but you don't think of a garbage can as being very honorable, but it has a very distinct use for it, to fill with garbage so that they can come pick it up. 
We think in times past there may be those nice chalices that you may drink from, but then there may also be chamber pots, and you don't want to drink from those. So in a house, there's these different vessels that are for use. Paul here is relating this great house to God's kingdom. Within God's kingdom, there are vessels that are there for honorable use and vessels that are in that kingdom for dishonorable use. Now, notice, this isn't about getting into the house. This isn't a passage about how to get into the kingdom. This is not saying, oh, you need to go ahead and clean up everything in you, and then you can enter into the house as a vessel. These vessels are already there, already used for service by the master. However, some of these vessels are for honorable and dishonorable use. How you will serve God matters based on if there's honor or dishonor there. This is connected to that seal that we saw last week in verse 19. The Lord knows who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So notice, God sovereignly chooses and knows and will never forget who is his, who is his true people, and yet those true people need to depart from iniquity. And this is what he says when we must get rid of that which is dishonorable inside of us. We must be cleansed. You ever wonder, why does, why does God, he saves us, why does he just get us to heaven right then? He saved us, he regenerated us, he made us justified. He can just take us up to heaven. He can have angels come and preach. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need you to spread the good news. Why? Why doesn't he just take us to heaven? Because it pleases him to use you. He smiles at his people following in his footsteps, just as he did on the earth for 33 years. So we must do this work of departing from iniquity. This is part of serving God. We cannot, if we want to serve God, we want to follow after God, do not think that we can hide the pet sins, that we can say, Lord God, I give you all of my life except for this part, that I can give you all of my desires and dreams and goals except for this, that we can hold back anything from him and be useful to his service as an honorable vessel. God wants all of you. He wants you to hold nothing back from him. And why? Because on that cross, he gave all of himself. Everything that he was. He died, giving all of his life. In fact, more than that, he took on sin, the one who was righteous and holy. He gave everything, even that sweet, perfect fellowship with the Father as the Father turned his face from God on the cross. We must cleanse ourselves from what is dishonorable. In the context here, those who are dishonorable are those false teachers like Hymenaeus and Philetus that he previously talked about. Stott says this, to purify ourselves from these is essentially to purge their falsehood from our minds and their wickedness from our hearts and lives. Purity then, Purity of doctrine and purity of life is the essential condition of being serviceable to Christ. This world has often taken us captive with their thoughts. And that is exactly what the Bible says we battle against, to take every thought captive, bringing it in submission to Jesus Christ. Instead, we have allowed the world to shape our thinking, to even shape the categories in which we think to help us define what we think, all the things of morality and, and men and women and good and evil and just and unjust. We've allowed the world to shape how we think about those things rather than purifying our minds of everything that is dishonorable in this world, every false teaching and doctrine, so that God then can fill us with what is good and true and righteous, making us vessels for honorable use for him. Iniquity is not just sin that we must cleanse ourselves from. It is a lifestyle of injustice and unrighteousness. It is a lifestyle of selfishness that looks for your own interests and not those of others. You see, moral standards aren't just for pastors. 
We need to get rid of every instance of unrighteousness and unmoral activity and thinking in our lives. This, that says, then, they will be set apart for holy, honorable uses. Notice, everyone is used. Even the dishonorable things, they're used for dishonorable purposes. And the honorable vessels for honorable ones. Don't think that if you are a Christian, you have a choice or not in serving the Lord. In fact, every single human being, even those that rebel against God in vile anger, will still be used to exalt his glory in the last day. However, the question before you is not whether you will serve the Lord leading to his glory. It's will you be used for an honorable use, a cause for his kingdom, to spread about his message of the gospel? Or will you be used in a dishonorable use? Now, we aren't talking about who's the preacher and who's the bathroom cleaner. In a good church, usually it's the same person. Rather, will you be a person who expands God's kingdom using all of your gifts, talents, spiritual ability, the things that bring you fulfillment and purpose? Or will you serve God's kingdom by being a warning to others of what happens when a person says they are a Christian and yet lives for the flesh and then makes a shipwreck of their lives. Both are used for God's glory. Both are used to point back to him. Which purpose are you going to be used for? An honorable use that expands his kingdom or a dishonorable one where others can look and say, tisk tisk, the shipwreck of their lives. So, if you want to serve God, get rid of what is dishonorable. Point number two, if you want to serve God, go after virtue. Pursue after virtue. You see, so many times we think the Christian life and sanctification, growth and godliness, is just getting rid of all the bad stuff in our lives. It's only the negative. But rather, it's getting rid of the bad, sure, purging the dishonorable, and then filling yourself with righteousness with goodness. Notice here, uh, back in verse number 21, he says, those that are cleansed themselves uh, will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart for what is holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Are you ready for the good works that he has already prepared for you? It says that when he saved you from time and material, way back in eternity past, he prepared already good works for you to walk in. Are you ready for them? In the military... Readiness is a big thing. You'll hear about it often, about the, the readiness to be able to go and fight the wars or do the mission or whatever it is. Are you ready for the mission that is in front of you? Well, get rid of what is dishonorable and pursue virtue. It says, so flee, verse 22, youthful passions. Run from them. As if you were being chased by a bear or a lion they will de destroy you. They will devour you. Flee from these things. Don't dabble with them. Don't go to the wild bear and see if he wants treats and a granola bar. Rather, you run away from the bear because he will destroy you. The Bible actually uses another metaphor. He says that the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he wants to devour every single Christian life he possibly can. We need to flee from youthful passions. We need to not be led merely by our bodily urges, fulfilling whatever, living like animals, fulfilling whatever urge comes upon us, longing for what is forbidden because it has some kind of uh, mystical appeal to us. I was been reading through uh, the book of Genesis again, um, which is a little early because I think you're supposed to start on January 1st and then fall out of favor in February or so from reading through the book of Genesis. Well, once you get to Leviticus, then it gets kind of hard. You're like, ah, oh, New Testament. And just this week, I came across Esau and Jacob. Esau had everything going for him. He was a man's man, burly man, Bear Grylls kind of man, covered in hair, it said. And he'd go out and he uh, uh, was an expert hunter. He had the skills of a hunter to go out and get choice game meat. He was everything that his father wanted him to be. 
Jacob, his brother, well, he was a, a gentler, softer kind of man who would spend his time in the tents. He wasn't his father's favorite. He wasn't his pride and joy. He cooked and cleaned and did the household chores. Well, after one uh, particular night of hunting, Esau comes back to the tent and he's famished. He's hungry. He hasn't caught anything. He's riddled with hunger. And he smells this lentil stew that his brother Jacob is cooking. He says, give it to me or I'm going to die. i got to have that stew. It smells so good. And Jacob, who's crafty and tricksy, who later becomes Israel, the father of her faith, <laughs> says, okay, I'll give you this if you give me your birthright. Now to us, that doesn't mean a whole lot, a birthright. What does that even mean? This is a significant legal standing that he is asking him for. He is holding out a contract of who is going to get an inheritance in fr whenever their father dies and asking him to sign before he gives him some of this stew. A birthright, you see, would get a double share of the inheritance. Every single male child, once a man died, would get a share of the inheritance, but the oldest would get the birthright, the double portion of the inheritance of what was passed on. He is saying, I want your double portion, and then I'll give you a portion of this stew. So what does Esau do? I mean, he, he had some options. Could have said no. Could have found something else to eat. Could have said, hey, dumb brother, give me it, and just took in the, the stew from him. He had many options, but instead he says, I don't care. What is it to me if I die? So even though a man's man, Esau's a little dramatic, and he goes ahead and sells his birthright, sells his inheritance, the thing that was rightfully due him as the firstborn because he was hungry, because his belly made some weird noises. In fact, in the New Testament, it warns of those whose God is their belly, who are led astray and led around merely by whatever bodily urge they have. So the question before us, like Esau, Christian, are you willing to sell your birthright for merely the desires of the flesh? for merely the bodily urges that may lead you, for merely the enticement of what is forbidden, that what you have before you is the option of being used for honorable use and expanding God's kingdom, will you trade that for merely fulfilling whatever grumbling in your stomach may come your way? Instead, he says, pursue righteousness. Sound living. Faith with his trust in God. Love, external care for others, not being all wrapped up in yourself, but looking at how you can serve others in peace, which in the Bible isn't just a cessation of hostilities, you've heard me say this before, but a wholeness and a completeness found in God. Pursue these things. Pursue sound living. Pursue trust in God. Pursue external care for others. Pursue after a wholeness that is found in God. This is how you go after virtue, ready for every good work. And he says, do this along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. We do this, not alone, not as hermits, not in private. We do this pursuing together. We do this with all those who call upon the name of the Lord. You shall sometimes wonder, why is this Christian life so hard alone? Why is it so difficult? Why do I try my best in myself, by myself, to make myself righteous and it's so difficult? And the reason why is because you were never meant to live this Christian life by yourself. You were meant to live this Christian life together. So if we are to flee what is dishonorable and pursue after virtue, you know what that's going to require if we're going to do this together? We've got to be honest with one another. We've got to be vulnerable with one another. Hey, brother, sister, this area of my life, I'm really struggling with it. Hey, brother, sister, you know what? I see this in your life that you're pursuing righteousness. Keep going after that. You know, this is an area that I really have a difficult time with, brother and sister. Help me with this. 
We need to pursue virtue together. We need to pursue this because this is the only way of life that gives us what is beautiful and good and true. Again, he hammers home the point, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. He has said this over and over and over again. We need to get rid of these kind of nitpicking attitudes in our lives. All they do is bring quarrels, fighting, bitterness, factions, divisions. And they may get people into tribes, but they do nothing to bring about virtuous living or expanding God's kingdom. In fact, quarreling does the opposite. Now, at times, Christians are pushed into conflict. And we see that more and more as our culture is changing. But that is not the same. Mere conflict is not the same as being quarrelsome. Disagreements are a fact of life in this age. Voicing disagreements in a godly way, rather than being harmful or divisive, can actually be very beneficial to the life of a body. Instead of hiding or bottling up issues, having the bravery and love to voice differences can lead to deeper, closer relationships between brothers and sisters. A quarreling Christian, rather, is one who's looking for a fight. They ignore opportunities to end the war. They abuse the faith for theological bloodlust. They trade seeing beauty to justify their own insecurities. A quarrelsome person stirs up unnecessary strife. Being quarrelsome seeks to hide behind different things, such as, well, I'm just being rowdy, or I'm just telling it like it is. But quarrelsome isn't cute. Quarrelsome leads to ungodliness, and we must put it away for us and rather pursue righteousness. Last point, not only if we want to serve God do we want to get rid of what is dishonorable, not only if you want to serve God must you go after virtue, but if you want to serve God, point others to him. It says, once again, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind. He's pointing Timothy back to those qualifications of an elder that he previously said. But the principles here aren't just for elders. They're good for every Christian who seeks to serve the Lord. So his first thing to him is don't be quarrelsome. Rather, be something else. Be kind. Kindness is a Christian virtue. Now, niceness is not. Niceness might just try to make someone feel good, but kindness, true kindness, does care about how people feel and yet will tell them the truth in love. He must also be able to teach. That means we must know the Bible. We must know its contents. We must be immersed as people of the book. We must also endure evil with patience. Persecution will come, especially if you are serving God, if you are advancing his kingdom. It means that evil will come. And how do we endure evil? Do we endure evil by new revolution? We endure evil by patience. We endure evil as Jesus himself endured evil by being gentle. And in fact, he says that to correct his opponents with gentleness. When you have opponents, when you have people that are against you, what do you want to do? Well, you want to be the one to slap them down with whatever argument. You want to be the one to shut them down. You want to be the one to, to, to give the, the diss and the burn. Rather, we should be gentle in correcting others. But there's also something else to this. Not only do we need to temper how we give correction, we are often scared to correct because we are scared how someone else is going to take it, and then we do no correction whatsoever. When we as Christians are called to be in each other's lives. And yet, that is what God may use, it says, to lead them to repentance. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. We must, in gentleness, in kindness, correct each other. Correct me. Because we're all in this thing together. When they repent, in fact, all who repent get blessing. What do they get in this blessing? Everyone who repents gets a knowledge of the truth, it says. Two, they come to their senses. Because sin itself is irrational and stupid. Sin looks like it's reasonable. Sin looks like it's appealing. But sin is dumb. Iniquity is stupid. 
You only come to your senses and rational thinking when you follow after righteousness. And three, it says, they escape the traps the devil has set for them. The devil puts out traps so that he can transform you from being something that is for honorable use into dishonorable use, and he wants to trick you. When we repent, we escape those traps of the devil. You see, some are captured by the devil to do his will. And this is exactly what the power that Jesus obliterated on the cross. That not only did he take our sin and satisfy the wrath of God for us, but he crushed the head of the serpent that was against us. He crushed the power that Satan has over us. Did you know that while he may tempt you, Satan has no power over you as a Christian at all? He has no claim over you. He did before. He could say, yes, he, they are following after iniquity, and so they're going to follow after me. Take the Pharisees, for instance, who Jesus says, your father is the devil. But rather, we who are believers, Satan now has not a shred of power over you. Jesus Christ stands as obliterating any authority he may have. So, application time. If you want to serve God, what should you do? Well, one... On November 9th, at 6.30, there is a Bible study about tough questions that we're going to learn about how to tell others about Jesus. I suggest you attend that. Application number two. What is our, how do we point others to him? Let me tell you a few things evangelism, or pointing others to him, is not. It is not your job to convert anyone. It's not your job to save anyone. It's not your job to convict anyone. It's not your job to convince anyone. That is all the Holy Spirit's job. It is just your job to tell. That's what you do. You tell others about Jesus. You point them to him. And so, I need four volunteers very quickly to come forward. Come forward now, right now. You say, well, I don't know how to tell them. I don't know what to say. Well, guess what? Here's step number one, baby step. A nice little round card that says, you're invited to Reformation Church, and that has an information on the back about how to contact us. Take one of these, and through this week, give them. Here you go. Everybody take one. Give them to someone in your life. Give them to a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, the guy at Starbucks, the cashier at the grocery store, somebody, anyone, random person walking down the street. You don't even have to say many words to him. All you need to do is give them this. This is the first step in trying to get over this intimidation that we may have of telling others about Jesus. It's not your job to do the work of the Holy Spirit, but when you are faithful... In following what he says to tell others, the Holy Spirit will use you to reform their lives and bring them to repentance. All right, everybody got it? I want everyone to hold it up so I can see you got it. All right. I'm going to be excited to hear about the stories of who you gave that to. So that church, we can move past these four walls and start to spread to advance God's kingdom in this lost and dying world that desperately needs the message of the gospel. Let us pray. Our great God, we thank you that you have given us this mission and you have given us the ability and opportunity to follow after you and serve you. So Lord, I pray that you help us to cleanse out those things that are dishonorable in our lives to pursue righteousness together as one church, and to tell others and point others to Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we pray these things knowing that they are good and honorable prayers to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.